Well, remember he was gay, and then at one point he said he wasn't gay anymore. Yeah. 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 Oh, but you know, I was gay all my life. I believe I was one of the first gay people to come out. But God let me know that he made Adam be with Eve, not Steve. For ages, Hollywood has catered to the elites. This is evident in the stories of Little Richard and Luther Vandross, who have both left an indelible mark on the industry with their undeniable talent and singing skills. Gonna tell and Mary Bond, Uncle John, he claim he has the music, but he had a lot. And dance with my mother and me. However, the industry's cutthroat nature has often tried to suppress their identities due to the prevalent discrimination against LGBTQ plus individuals. Little Richard and Luther Vandross have openly discussed their struggles with being gay in Hollywood's high society. Everybody got mad with me for saying that. You know, I, I, I didn't mind telling the world that I was gay. I was gay. And uh, uh, it's nice to be happy. It sure is. I was happy and I wanted the world to know that I was happy. And I wasn't ashamed. Little Richard even allegedly warned Luther Vandross about producer Clive Davis, knowing the risks of showing one's true self behind the scenes. You could be mm -hmm. attracted um, to, the, to the person regardless of gender. So what really happened to them behind closed doors? Little Richard was a legendary American singer, pianist, and songwriter. Born in Macon, Georgia, in 1932 was open about his identity as a gay man. Charles White's 1984 biography, The Life and Times of Little Richard, shares stories from Richard and those who knew him, illustrating his journey from a young gospel singer in Georgia to a groundbreaking figure in Southern rock and roll. The book highlights how his early S experiences shaped his identity over time. From a young age, Richard felt a strong connection to his feminine side, often wearing his mother's makeup and clothes. This led to a clash with his deacon father, who kicked him out of the house when he was just 15. After that, Richard began performing at various venues around Atlanta and soon started touring the Chitlin Circuit, a network of safe and welcoming performance spaces for black musicians, comedians, and entertainers during the era of segregation in the South. He built his career in Hollywood as an American singer and soon became the architect of rock and roll. Little Richard's most iconic work came in the mid-1950s. His electrifying performances, frenetic piano playing and powerful raspy vocals set the stage for the birth of rock and roll. His innovative style with its emotive vocals and energetic rhythms also helped shape other music genres like soul and funk. He influenced countless artists across various genres from rock to hip-hop, and his contributions helped define rhythm and blues for generations. One of his biggest hits, Tutti Frutti, released in 1955, quickly climbed the pop charts in both the United States and the United Kingdom. After Tutti Frutti hit number two on the Billboard R&B chart, in 1956, Richard enjoyed a few years of rock and roll stardom. Interestingly, the original lyrics of Tutti Frutti were quite explicit and referenced another gay man, Tutti Frutti Good Booty. If it doesn't fit, don't force it, you can grease it, make it easy. The cleaned up lyrics of his songs highlight the struggle between Little Richard's public image and his private life. On stage, he could be his true flamboyant self, but off stage, he often had to retreat when things got too intense or controversial, especially in the deeply conservative South. This was during a time when the ideal American family was epitomized by shows like Ozzy and Harriet. A director Lisa Cortez said, Richard was not only becoming a star in 1955, but he's doing so at a time that is fraught with tremendous danger for black people and queer people, and he is unabashedly himself. This highlighted his struggle, as he had no one to support him. His father had already kicked him out of the house for being gay, and he was disowned by his own family. Finding an identity in Hollywood was also difficult due to the culture of the 1900s, making it hard for him to fit in where he couldn't express himself openly, especially because of discrimination. However, his plans changed when his next big hit, Long Tall Sally, topped the R&B chart in 1956, followed by another classic, Good Golly Miss Molly, in 1958. Over three years, Richard amassed 18 hit songs. Right after, by the end of the decade, he felt a divine calling to leave secular music behind. This led him to enroll in Oakwood College to study theology, as he believed God was guiding him in a new direction. Following that, his single Long Tall Sally topped the Billboard Rhythm and Blues bestsellers chart in 1956. Over the next three years, he released 15 more hits in rapid succession. In 1962, after a period of stepping away from rock and roll for his born-again Christian faith, concert promoter Don Arden convinced him to 
tour Europe. During this tour, the Beatles even opened for him on some dates. While some might argue that his divine calling helped him become a proper man again, this is hard to believe considering the prejudice he faced in Hollywood. Many fans believe that he turned to religion in an attempt to change himself and alleviate the guilt he felt about being gay. Richard stated that he found joy in his biblical studies and was drawn to the idea of praising God through music. He believed he had made peace with God and should live according to God's intentions. However, he also felt he was battling devils during this time. Time, he was once caught asking a deacon's son to expose himself and struggled with self-hatred due to his unnatural affections. In his 20s, he engaged in voyeurism, paying men to let him watch them doing physical acts with women, sometimes under coercion. He said, My whole gay activities were really into masturbation. He said, I'd always be mad after I finished. Be mad at myself. Don't want to talk about it. Don't want to answer no questions. His voyeuristic activities eventually landed him in jail for S misconduct when he was caught with a couple in a car at a gas station in Macon. After taking a break from secular music, Little Richard made a comeback in 1986 with the release of Great Gosh Almighty on his album Lifetime Friend. He continued to perform and released more music, including a Disney children's album called Shake It All About in 1992. Richard also made several film and TV appearances, often accompanied by his iconic catchphrase, Shut Up. In 1962, Richard was convinced to tour Europe, thinking it would be a gospel tour. However, the audience's lukewarm response to his gospel music led him back to rock and roll. This return reignited his career, and he enjoyed another three decades of musical success. In a 1982 interview with David Letterman, Richard shared that he had been gay his entire life but felt that God had made him aware that he may Made Adam be with Eve, not Steve. Yeah, but you know, I was gay all my life. I believe I was one of the first gay people to come out. But God let me know that he made Adam be with Eve, not Steve. In 1995, he took pride in telling Penthouse that I've been gay all my life and I know God is a God of love, not of hate. In a 2012 profile in GQ, he candidly discussed partaking in with both men and women and described himself as omni -est. He said, We are all both male and female. S to me is like a smorgasbord. Whatever I feel like, I go for. During his interview with Three Angels Broadcasting, it was quite a surprise when he sang a different tune. No pun intended. He talked about pop culture, its acceptance of queer identities, and how it seemed to overlook faith. He said, All these things, so much unnatural affection. So many people just do everything and don't think about God. Don't want no parts of him. Just like Little Richard, another American singer was rising to stardom during the 1970s, and it was no other than Luther Vandross. While he was in high school, Vandross started the first Patti LaBelle fan club and took on the role of president. And he became my first fan club president. Wow. And he became like my best, best friend. He also performed with a group called Shades of Jade, which even played at the Apollo Theater. In his early days in showbiz, he made several appearances on the Apollo's famous amateur night. During his time with a theater workshop called Listen My Brother, he worked on singles like Only Love Can Make a Better World and Listen My Brother. The group performed in front of huge crowds at the Harlem Cultural Festival in late August 1969. Right after that, Vandross appeared with the group in the pilot episode and several episodes of the first season of Sesame Street. Vandross hit it big when he joined the pop dance group Change, which French-Italian businessman Jacques Fred Petrus started. In 1980, he was the lead singer on their hits The Glow of Love and Searching. In a 2001 interview with Vibe, Vandross called The Glow of Love the most beautiful song I've ever sung in my life. Both songs were from Change's debut album, Asterisk The Glow of Love Asterisk. Vandross was supposed to work on Change's next album, Miracles, in 1981, but turned it down because the pay wasn't good enough. This decision led to a new recording contract with Epic Records. He also did background vocals for Miracles and for a new group created by Petrus called the BB&Q Band. That busy year also saw Vandross relaunch his solo career with his debut album, Never Too Much. Besides the hit title track, the album included his version of the Bacharach and David's song, A House Is Not A Home. The song Never Too Much, which he wrote, topped the R&B charts. This period also marked the start of his songwriting partnership with bassist Marcus Miller, who played on many of his tracks and helped produce some of them. The album was arranged by Vandross's high school friend, Nat Adderley Jr., who continued to work with him throughout his career. 
He continued excelling in his talent, however, faced numerous issues. Many people talked about his S in the industry as he never married or had children. Vandross concealed his S from people in Hollywood as he knew talking about it wouldn't do any good for him. In a 2006 interview with Out Magazine, Bruce Valanche, a friend of Vandross, shared that Vandross once confided in him, saying, He said to me, No one knows I'm in the life. He had very few s contacts. According to Valanche, Vandross had very few S relationships and experienced his longest romantic relationship with a man while living in Los Angeles in the late 1980s and early 1990s, which explained to many fans why he didn't marry or have children as he was gay. Ironically, Luther, who sang so many romantic love songs, never got to experience his own love story. In a 2001 interview with Vibe magazine, he revealed, I'm still waiting. The time that I've spent being in love has never been reciprocated. Those are just the circumstances. I want to play house, he added. I want somebody who's not on payroll to care about where I am. Despite all his incredible achievements, Luther Vandross faced some deeply personal challenges behind the scenes, especially with his former record label boss, Clive Davis. According to his close friend, Patti LaBelle, Clive pressured Luther into participating in activities that went against his will, including controversial gay rituals. Interestingly, in 2013, long after two marriages and divorces, Clive Davis came out as bisexual. This was a major revelation, considering he had believed he was hetero for the first five decades of his life. Clive openly discussed his journey of self-discovery and exploring his attraction to men, which marked a brave and honest disclosure. After coming out, Clive Davis entered into a committed relationship with a doctor in 1990, which lasted until 2004. Meanwhile, the public's perception of Luther Vandross as an R&BS symbol added complexity to rumors about his S orientation. Many fans and the general public were surprised and shocked when rumors about him being gay emerged. Some even speculated that Clive Davis might have had a hand in these rumors. In 2017, Patti LaBelle nearly broke the internet when she posthumously outed Luther Vandross on live television during an interview on Bravo's Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen. LaBelle confirmed the long-standing rumors that Vandross was gay. This revelation wasn't just another piece of celebrity gossip. It shed light on Vandross's personal struggles with his identity. LaBelle, who was close friends with Vandross, shared that he had a tough time coming to terms with the idea of coming out publicly during his lifetime. Patti LaBelle opened up about her close friend Luther Vandross's S during an interview on Watch What Happens Live. She shared how she first met Vandross, who passed away in 2005, and mentioned that he was the first president of her fan club. Then, Andy Cohen asked LaBelle about Vandross's S, leading to a candid discussion. The Lady Marmalade singer shared why Luther Vandross never wanted to openly discuss his S. LaBelle explained that her talented friend was hesitant to reveal his orientation. She fondly remembered his incredible talent, but mentioned that he chose to keep his ass private out of fear of how his mother would react. She said, We talked about it. Basically, he did not want his mother to be, although she might have known, but he wasn't going to come out and say this to the world. And he had a lot of lady fans, and he told me he just didn't want to upset the world. She continued, And he had a lot of lady fans. He told me that he just didn't want to upset the world. It was hard for him. He never publicly confirmed his S, although many in the R&B industry were aware of it. Some fans criticized Patty for outing him after his death. This topic remains sensitive within the LGBTQ community. Despite progress in civil rights for gay, lesbian, and trans individuals, some still don't feel safe openly sharing their S orientation. When LaBelle spilled the beans, people had mixed feelings. Some fans felt she was just stating what everyone already knew in the music scene, but others thought she went too far. They believed it wasn't her place to reveal such personal information, especially since Vross had chosen to keep it private. Outing someone is a really sensitive issue in the LGBTQ community. Historically, sharing someone's S orientation or gender identity without their consent has been seen as a major betrayal and even dangerous. People in the LGBTQ community have often often faced mockery, discrimination, and even violence because of being outed. Even though we've made great strides in civil rights and acceptance for lesbian, gay, bi -S, and transgender people, coming out is still risky and takes a lot of bravery. The risks are even greater for those who belong to multiple marginalized groups. For example, being both black and gay adds another layer of complexity and difficulty. Back in the 1980s, when Luther Vandross was at the height of his career, he would have been very aware of these challenges. Coming out as a gay black man during that time, especially in the hypermasculine and often judgmental world of R&B and soul music, must have been incredibly intimidating. You can imagine the kind of internal conflict and anxiety Vandross might have faced, wanting to live his 
truth, but fearing the loss of everything he had worked so hard to achieve. If Luther had come out as gay, it would have caused a huge stir in his community. There was no safe space for someone like him to be open about their s due to the widespread and strict ideas about masculinity. Coming out would have meant he was paving a difficult and lonely path as possibly the first openly gay R&B star, a daunting challenge. Facing such a situation would mean dealing with not just but also racism from both inside and outside the community. Male singers back then often had to embody a certain image for their female fans, who saw them as the ultimate fantasy. Luther, with his smooth voice that made fans swoon, was no exception. Publicly identifying as gay could have risked his appeal to those fans, and consequently, his commercial success. It's a tough spot to be in when your personal truth might jeopardize your career, especially in an industry as image conscious as music. Interestingly, it seems Luther never really cared about what people thought regarding his S. He just chose not to confirm or deny the rumors. In a 2001 interview with Vibe, Van Ross humorously addressed the long standing rumors about his S saying, What do you want to know? He asked, Am I bi coastal? Yeah. I have houses in Beverly Hills and in New York. I know that I'm paying a price for being so private, and I do wonder if it's worth it. However, that's not it. The industry just didn't pressurize him but also wanted to take advantage of him, while Luther was itching to take center stage. And in 1981, he made a game-changing move. He signed a deal with Clive Davis, a major player in the music world who had just launched his new record label, J Records. The buzz was that Davis saw something truly special in Luther, and he was spot on. With Davis backing him up, Luther was all set to shine. The 1980s were a golden time for soul and R&B. People were craving smooth voices and genuine lyrics, and Luther had both in spades. Clive Davis wasn't just dipping his toes into the industry, he was making a splash. Back then, he discovered talents like Whitney Houston and Alicia Keys, artists who could deliver performances that tug at your heartstrings. Davis had a knack for spotting rising stars and knew exactly how to make them shine. But it's not all smooth sailing with Clive Davis. Some folks say he's got a knack for drama, and there are stories about him getting into it with artists over creative differences. Clive loved to do things his way, and that didn't sit well with everyone. Some felt like their creative freedom was being stifled. Despite the drama, Clive Davis has had a massive impact on the music industry. He's not just a record executive, he's a savvy dealmaker who knows how to make the big moves that keep the business buzzing. When Clive says, let's make a hit, people pay attention. However, here's the twist. An artist like Little Richard, who has experience working in Hollywood in the same environment as Vandross, actually tried to warn Luther about Clive Davis. Rumor has it that Little Richard, having seen how powerful record execs can be, was concerned about Clive's intentions. He advised Luther to be cautious, but Luther was too excited about the opportunity and trusted Clive's solid reputation. Luther kept churning out great music and his fans loved it, but things started to go downhill. Here's where it gets interesting. After signing with Clive Davis, Luther's health began to decline. He faced serious health issues that impacted his ability to perform and record. His mental health also took a hit. Friends and fans noticed he was more stressed and less happy. People began to wonder if Barry White's warning had been on point. Could Clive Davis's influence have been part of the problem? The timing made a lot of people suspicious. In 1987, the Soul Train Music Awards, created by Don Cornelius, were gearing up. The next year, Don planned for Dion and Luther to host the show. But just three weeks before the event, Luther got cold feet. He called Dion and said he couldn't do it. Luther was feeling self-conscious about his weight gain and didn't want to appear on stage looking different from the year before. Despite his friends and fans loving him for his music, he struggled with his self-image. Here's where it gets even juicier. Luther's friend Whitney Houston tried to boost his confidence. She told him that his weight didn't matter because his voice and passion for music were what really touched people. But Luther was determined to look a certain way. He even mentioned wanting to be as slim as a particular waiter. The pressure to maintain a certain image might have taken a toll on his mental health. Many believed that the demands of his career and staying at the top were a big factor. And then, in 2003, Luther had a stroke, which shocked fans and the media alike. Rumors swirled that his lifestyle and health choices played a big part. Luther admitted that his weight and health issues were partly due to his love for food and his struggle to stay healthy. The stroke left him in a coma for nearly two months, and he had to relearn how to talk and sing. 
At the 2004 Grammy Awards, Vandross made a special appearance via a pre-taped video to accept his Song of the Year award for Dance with My Father. His mother, Mary, picked up the award in person for him. His final public appearance was on May 6, 2004, on The Oprah Winfrey Show. Sadly, Vandross passed away on July 1, 2005, at JFK Medical Center in Edison, New Jersey, due to complications from a stroke at the age of 54. While numerous celebrities attended his funeral, many fans were shocked and saddened to see such a talent pass away, especially given the impact on his mental health. Although rumors about his personal life are still discussed in the industry today, his voice is still remembered as smooth as silk. That's it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching.